motherhood, it was a lot different than I thought. It was more tiring. I was like, I don't know if it was the schedules or the, just the pull in different directions. Christina, when she was younger um, in elementary school, she wrote me a, a happy Mother's Day. And she wrote, happy Mother's Day. And she went, you're the best mom in the whole tired world. She forgot and tired, but I was like, it fits. It's perfectly fine, tired, because I'm tired. It's like more than tired, actually. Wasn't expecting that. But I think it's so much more than motherhood where we get tired. And more than tired, often I know we find ourselves weary. You might think they're the same things, kind of, but actually they're different. Tired is when something on the outside, you're physically exhausted and you need rest. Weary is something on the inside. It's when your thoughts start to go negative and your patience is like <gasps> warm, thin, and exhausted. And you have this feeling like, I don't know if I could keep doing this same thing over and over again. It's wearing on me. I feel drained of all strength and of life. I can't handle it. Something on the inside, weary. But I'm so thankful that God addresses weary in the scriptures. It even says that Jesus got weary. And that helps me. Let me show you this. In John 4, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat there by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is noon. It's the heat of the day, the heat of a moment. Jesus gives us an example. He's weary from life. His disciples are in town, so he sits by water. There's a lot to be said just right there when we're weary. But I'm so thankful. I love that Jesus is the son of God, but he's also the son of man, which means he's touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. He understands us. He's gone through some things. And so he's like, you know just what you're talking about. So thankful for that. In 1969, there was a singing duo called Simon and Garfunkel. Anybody remember them? I know, I like their music, I really did. But in 1969, they were playing before then, but he, they were writing a song at this time. Now you have to understand, America was in a very tumultuous time at this, in this year. There had been a series of assassinations. Vietnam was still going on and there were a lot of racial riots. So not comfortable. Paul Simon, who wrote a lot of the music, said at this time, he just kept listening to a gospel album over and over again. And there was this one song on the gospel album that had two lines that struck a chord in him. Those two lines were, I'll be a bridge over deep waters if you'll trust in my name. I'll be a rock to you in a weary land. He just couldn't get away from those two lines. And so he wrote a song with these lyrics. When you're weary and feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I'll dry them all. I'm on your side, oh, when times get tough and friends just can't be found. Like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. That song was penned to bring solace and comfort to anyone that was weary or in distress. And it hit the heart of America, not only America, in other countries, too, it sold over 25 million copies of that album titled Bridge Over Troubled Water. Why? How did it resonate like that so much? There will be times we are weary. We need something in the inside. 
And we need someone to come alongside us and to help us. Our bridge is really when we have a relationship with the Lord. He is our bridge over troubled waters. There are troubled waters in this world, and there probably will be more. In fact, choppy waters, maybe waves crashing and pulling on the beachfront of our lives. It happens to us. What do we do? How do we do when we live in a weary land and we feel this too? Let's go back to that story in the Bible where Jesus is sitting by the well. There's the most surprising encounter that happens as Jesus is sitting by the well. Here comes a Samaritan woman. She's coming. It's the noon hour. Now you have to know that no one draws water at the noon hour. It was more of a social time, so the women would go together in the morning. It was cooler. That right there tells us, why is this woman by herself in the heat of the day coming to the well? She's not well liked. She's not well loved. She's ostracized. She's a very well-worn woman and maybe can't handle the whispers and the criticism that she hears about herself. So she finds a time to come to the well alone. I don't know how many times she went there and was alone, but on this day, Jesus is sitting there. And when she comes, he initiates a conversation with her. He says, could you give me a drink of water? She, she's a little defensive. And I can tell you that just by her response. But I'm sure life had hurt her a lot. So she's like, ah. her response is, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask me, a Samaritan, and a woman at that, for a drink. Because the Jews and the Samaritans have nothing to do with each other. There was horrible prejudice against each other, the Jews and the Samaritans. They didn't share anything, plates, cups, nothing. And she was a woman at that, probably hadn't been treated well by men. And she's like, well, how are you talking to me, why would you ask anything of me? Mm. I love that Jesus breaks through barriers, barriers that are social, racial, or gender. He's like, I'm looking to reach you in your heart. Things we think keep us from him. He's like, mm, I can go right past that. I don't know what her facial expression was or her body language. But I think we all know that when we're hurt in life or well-worn, we got a little edge on us, a little edge that other people don't always want to be around. Maybe that's why even the women didn't want to be with her. She's edgy. She's tough. She's been hurt. But you know what I love? Jesus doesn't bother him. He's still going to engage in a conversation with her. Other people are like, mm. Jesus continues on, and he says this to her. Jesus replied, if only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring or like a fountain within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Did, did he just say that God had a gift for her? 
If she knew the gift God had for her, nobody would give her the time of day. And yet, he's saying God would have a gift for her. You can hear the loving longing in Jesus' tone as he's trying to help her and he's contrasting natural things with spiritual things. You're talking about natural water where you're going to be thirsty again. I'm talking about spiritual water that's going to satisfy you on the inside. You're talking about outside things. I'm talking about inside things. But then he asks, you'll have to call your husband, though. She's like, oh, I don't have a husband. I don't think Jesus' expression was unkind in any way when he says this. But he says, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now, he isn't your husband. So what you said was true. Could you imagine hearing like everything that maybe no one else likes you for? You have to understand in this day and age, it wasn't the women who gave the divorce. It was the man. So she's rejected all these times. I don't love you. I don't want you. There's something wrong with you. You're ruined, damaged goods. That's what happened to her. And it's like Jesus went through her junk drawer. It's, it's so embarrassing. Everything I don't want anybody to see. And yet, you would still talk to me that Jesus would pass all my faults and failure and still engage in a conversation with me when nobody else would? Yeah. She recognizes, she goes, mm, he's a prophet. I, I, I think you're a prophet. So she kind of deflects the conversation like we all do when we're uncomfortable. She goes, okay, um, you know, the Jews say that we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem, and my people say in this mountain. So if you want to worship God, where do I worship him? Jerusalem or this mountain? Jesus says to her, he says, it's not Jerusalem or the mountain. It's not the outside things. It's not places. And then he says, you don't even know what you're worshiping. But salvation comes from the Jews. It's not where you're worshiping. It's how you're worshiping. And then he says this. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That means from your heart, on the inside. You worship him and come to him from your heart. For the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is a spirit. So those who worship him must worship him from the inside, in your heart, spirit and truth. The woman said, I, I know Messiah is coming, the one who's called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. So he like unveils himself. I am he, the one you're speaking to. I am the Messiah. This is the first time he reveals himself as the Messiah to this woman. I'm like, could you imagine what she's feeling at this? He's saying, I'm the one you're looking for. It's me, right here, in real time. She's like, oh, who would have known that this woman had a longing in her heart for the Messiah? And who would have known? Did she ever think that he had a longing in his heart for her? Because he does. And the father looks, and he's like, I got it. I see you. She believes it and receives it. How do you know? She leaves her water pot, the natural, at the well. 
She leaves it. She goes back into the city where she's not liked. And she just can't help. It's bubbling up in her. Come and see. Come and see a man who touched me right where I, I am. He knew the secrets of my whole life. I guess she's not embarrassed at this point. Come and see. Is this not the Christ? Is this not the Messiah? The one that we read about in Deuteronomy? Is this not him? Do you know that many of the people from that Samaritan town went out to see Jesus and they believed him and went, he is this Jesus. This is him. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ that matches Deuteronomy. Who would have thought that this woman would start and spark a revival in her own hometown? And who would know that you could start, spark a revival in your marriage, in your own heart, in your home, wherever you work? God's heart is for us. He loves us so much as a people. I think his loving, longing tone is, can you see me? Can I break through those barriers? Can you just call on me from your heart, spirit and truth from your heart? We all know who knows us and loves us at heart. And we know when there's a facade. God's like, can we break through that heart to heart? Well, the beginning of this year in January went on a, a little private retreat. And I happened to be in a cathedral that was 150 years old. It was it was really pretty magnificent. It was beautiful. It hadn't been anything like it. It was patterned after like Europe and stained glass. And I, I was in there by myself at this day and it had marble. I'm trying to tiptoe and I'm hearing my echo. And so I go up and the steps to the altar are marble and I, I kneel down on the lowest step and I just put my hands in my face on the cold marble. It's January, so it's really cold. And I couldn't stop crying. I just had tears streaming down my face. And not because I was sad. I just kept thinking, the everlasting arms of the Lord have never grown weary for me. And I'm like, thank you, God. You've never been weary of me coming to you over and over again with everything I do wrong. You've, you've just helped me. And I know that... Everything in here means so much to me now because I know you from my heart and I know you love me even though I'm so not perfect. I, I just was so thankful because I remember a time, it's so clear to me, being in church, churches like that, where I'm doing everything on the outside Every ritual, every religious thing I could do, I, I did it. And yet I still felt so empty on the inside. I honestly did not know what I was worshiping. I did know that I was afraid of life and I was afraid of God. And when I came to know him in a relationship, it was so different. It wasn't a religion that was like hard and cold like the marble floor. It was a relationship where I talked to God and he talks to me and it was real and as near as the warm tears that I just couldn't seem to stop wiping down my face. I was like, thank you, God, to know you in the middle of life brings me comfort. I'm so, so thankful for who he is. He's our bridge in troubled times. And there will be troubled times and tumultuous things will happen on the earth. We may be coming up on more. What do we do? How do we not cause, you know, help it from pulling on us and pulling on us like these crashing waves where there's nothing in us at all? I know for myself, I've always had to ask myself, am I caring more than I should? Which 
I am a lot of times. This hasn't been easy for me. Before we realize it, sometimes we're carrying burdens, we're carrying past memories, we're carrying mistakes, everything we've done and haven't done and should have done and things that were done to us. And they can be traumatic and they can be tormenting. And if that's not a barrier or a problem that we have, then it's just everyday life. It's worries and cares and distractions. And you know, we've all been like, if one more thing breaks down, I can't handle it. Right? That's why I always love that Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke or way of doing things upon you. You can learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You'll find something, rest on the inside. I was praying this year, I came to him, I'm like, Lord, this problem is bothering me and I got this and that. And it's so interesting because he gave me a scripture I didn't expect, I, I had never really noticed much before. I've, I've studied in so many translations, I, I can't give it to you exact, I could just give it to you in the word he gave to me. It helped me inside. And this is how it went from Isaiah. I made you. I am he, I'll carry you. From infancy to old age, I'll sustain you, I'll carry you. And I was like, okay, I'm okay. See, because sometimes, for me, I've tried to drink or draw water out of the wrong wells. You know, it's like, I, I need a vacation even though I just had one, I need one from my vacation because that, I, I, I just, I'm not okay still, you know. I, I need to buy something. That's what, I'm gonna feel better if I, if I buy, so I need something, you know, new, or I need a facial, or, you know. I, I went one time for a facial, and they were putting lotion on my hand, and she's like, relax your hand. I'm like, okay. She's like, no, relax your hand. I'm like, okay, I can't, I can't relax my hand. I, I just, it's not working. And then, and then you think, there's something wrong with me. Anybody else would be totally fine, and I am not fine. There's something wrong with me. I want to pose something different. Maybe it's just the wrong well. You're trying to get life from something that will always make you thirsty. So what do we do? What do we need? We need living water. We need something in us, something that comes from God. And he's so willing to give it to us. When he said that to the Samaritan woman, I believe he'd say it to us, if you just knew the gift God wanted to give you, something to settle your soul on the inside. But in Jeremiah, God says this, I will refresh and give rest to the weary and satisfy or saturate the faint or sorrowful soul. I love that word, satisfy or saturate. I'm like, oh God, put a hose on me, please. I need water. I need something in me. I do, I think about that. Where do we get this living water? Even the, the Samaritan woman, she's like, where do you have it? Where do you get it? You get it from the scriptures. The Bible, when you read your Bible consistently, it will get in you. The water of the word of God will get in you, even if you don't understand it, if I can encourage you. If you don't understand it, still keep reading it. Read it and read it and read it, and the water of the word, Living water will get in you. Where else? When you come to church consistently over and over again, it's a well that will never run dry. It will spring up all over you and splash over you. It will get in you too. And we need that. I went to Rome years ago, and I went to what is supposed to be the most stunning fountain in the world, the Trevi Fountain. Has anybody been there? Okay, so I'm like, oh, I'm gonna see one of the most famous fountains in the world. But on the day I went, they were fixing it and there was no water. 
It's like licking a pool that's empty. Something's really wrong. There's supposed to be water here. There's nothing. I could see pipes. And I'm like, it's so underwhelming. What is everybody talking about? Do you know that's sometimes how we live our lives? We're empty. Pipes. And God's like, you, you need water. You need living water and eternal life flow, flowing through you, out from you, and, and splashing out in revival all around you. God has that for us. But it can start and begin and always is because we have a connection with the giver of living water. He gives us these things. He's so good. He's the giver of life. And it's not a religious form. It's not on the outside. It's not a ritual. It's a relationship. It's heart to heart. And he is longing to reach you right where you are, past every barrier. He's like right to your heart. I love that so thankful for who he is and that he loves us that much. And no matter what you've done and what edges you've had on your life, he continues to engage in a conversation with us. Continues to look to reach our heart, to help us. In this verse right here in John, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out saying, if anybody thirsts, come to me and drink. I, I really love this verse right here. But I want to share with you where it is in context. On the last day of the great feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, still celebrated today. On that last day, they have something called a water pouring or, or water drawing ceremony. And they go and they get water from the pool of Siloam and they bring it in a procession to the altar and they pour it out in memory of when the children of Israel are in the wilderness and they have no water and they're thirsty and they think they're gonna die out there. God opens a rock and gushes water to them. He's like, you're not going to die out there. I'm going to sustain you. I'm going to take care of you. It's at that place Jesus stands up and he doesn't whisper because he wants everyone to be able to hear it. He cries out and he says, if anybody's thirsty, Come to me and drink. What's he saying? I'm the rock of your salvation. I'm your rock in a weary land. Can you hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying? Come and see. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Come to me. I'll give you rest in your soul. Come and drink. My daughter, she went through a really, really traumatic time when she was a young adult, and she was not okay emotionally. As a mom, I was just, just burdened with every guilt and things I've done wrong, and I'm trying everything to help her. I just, and I couldn't. She still wasn't thriving. And I'm like, oh God, what do I do? Help me. I'm praying. I'm praying. And God gives me a mini vision. It wasn't a dream. It was a mini vision, and I was starring in it. I was like, okay. And it was a swimming pool. And Christine and I, she's a young adult, we're at the wall in the shallow end. Jesus, I could see him, he's up to the waist, he's in a deeper end. And he's motioning to me, come, come out to me. And I'm like, 
well, I'm with Christina right now, and, I, and I'm going to come. When she comes, and we're going to come together, I'm trying to help her. Even though I'm not helping her, I'm trying to help her. And he kept motioning to me, come, just you, without her. And I remember, I was like, I can't. I, I can't leave her. I, I, can't, I can't come without her. But I remember he kept motioning me. And hesitantly and fearfully, I saw myself swim out to him. And then as though standing behind him, I heard him say, she'll come later. But she's not going to come to you. She's going to come to me. She doesn't need you. She needs me. I was like, oh. I could do everything on the outside. Only God could give her what she needed on the inside. And then I'm watching. I see her on the wall as a young adult. She transforms into a little girl, just like I remember her, five or six. It was so vivid, so real, swimming, just like a little girl right into the everlasting arms that embrace her, which is the Lord. I thought that was so interesting. Because the scriptures say we have to soften and humble our heart like a child when we come to the Lord. And she did just that. She never looked at me that I had peace. She was where she needed to be. Do you sense the Lord motioning to you? Come and see. Come to me. Come and drink. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every person here. And I know you love them and long to reach their hearts. I thank you, Lord God, for your your kindness to them and your mercy, Father, that you will fill them where they need and they will no longer be a weary soul, but to be filled with life, living water, and have rest and peace. In Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and eyes closed, if you came this morning and you sense the Lord tugging at your heart that you're the one he's motioning to come to him or maybe to come back to him. We're going to say a prayer. Not going to have you stand up. Not going to have you come to the front. But sitting right in your chair, if you're watching online, this prayer is for you as well. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. If that's you that I'm talking to and you say, you know what, Alan, I need to come to the Lord. I need to come back to him. Would you pray for me? Would you just slip your hand up real quickly across this auditorium as we begin to pray? Thank you. Thank you for that. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray. Maybe you didn't lift your hand. You wanted to. That's okay. You can pray this prayer from your heart. I'm going to lead you in it. You're going to pray this prayer after me. If you're watching online, if you're by yourself, pray it out loud. If you're with others, pray it quietly. If you're here, we're going to pray this together. Say, dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ. Because I've said yes to you. Now, with heads still bowed, just for a moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who've come to you for the very first time and for those who have come back. I thank you that you have received them with open arms. And Lord, we're grateful for what you will do in them and through them. So much bright future ahead. Father, I pray this morning also for those who, who were hurting because of situations with their mom or desire to be a mom and never were. And Lord, I thank you that you're able 
to provide help and comfort and strength even during these times that this can still be a day of rejoicing. Lord, we're grateful for all that you do. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I got two things, if you'll just hang on and before you go, two, two quick things. One, if you prayed that prayer with us, if you're online and you prayed that prayer here, there's a card by your feet or you can scan that right there and that gives us the information. We will pray for you, we'll get you some information and we'll pray for you every week. We do not miss, we know the value of that. The second thing is, if you are a woman, there's only two choices. If you are, if you are a woman, If you're a woman, we have a rose for you. You don't have to be a mom, just a woman. And as you leave, we got a rose for you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We love you. We're praying for you. Have a great week. Happy Mother's Day. 